I really appreciate everybody joining us today. I'm Jim O'Callaghan, President and CEO of the South County EDC. You know, at, every year we hold our elected officials reception. This year uh, we had to get a little creative, but we thought it was extremely important, even now more than ever, to make sure that we maintain that connection between our elected officials and our businesses here in the South County. So with that, we decided to create a webinar series this year to continue access in a, a little bit more moderated session than you normally would have, I guess. Um, the elected officials are probably happy they don't have to wear hats and have people chase them down all over the, uh, the venue. But in this setting, we thought it was appropriate to have two to three of our local representatives at a time, be able to share the great things going on in their community, share a lot of the hard work that's being done to help you know, move us from where we are today to where we need to be um, so that we can all continue to operate and build the communities that we've known here in the South County for so long. Um, uh -oh. we're, we're especially thankful today to have uh, Mayor Dedina and Mayor Salas with us. We're gonna hear from them and all the great things going on in Imperial Beach and Chula Vista. And in the short time I've been here, I've had the pleasure of working with both communities and really being able to say from uh, my experience, the incredible work that you're doing to help the people that are struggling today to make ends meet and keep their businesses open. Um, Chula Vista did an amazing job getting grants out to the businesses as quick as they could through the CARES Act program. Imperial Beach, the same thing. And um, both communities doing tremendous outreach and door knockings, making sure people understand what's respo what responsible business practices are during this time so that we can hopefully um, move past the pandemic in a pretty timely manner and get everybody open and operating normally. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's just great to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one and be able to share ideas and hear directly from our representatives as to what they're doing and let them know what we need from them. So this is a forum for that. Each of our representatives will get about 10 minutes, share some great things that are going on. We'll then open it up for some Q&A. And if both of you would like to stay on after you've given your presentation, we could bring you back together and maybe have kind of a little round table between the three of us and chat a little bit about things going on. Um, but with Without further ado, I do want to thank Cox Communications for actually sponsoring our series, uh, this both this edition and our December 1st one um, that we'll talk a little bit more about later. But I do want to let everybody know. So just as a bit of housekeeping, you, are, you came into the session on mute. Um, we would appreciate it if you would keep your microphone muted uh, until we get to the Q&A portion. During that time, if you use the little hand raise icon, or just notify us in the chat of a question you have, we will be glad to share that with our esteemed mayors. And then we'll get that question answered for you. Um, additionally, during uh, the rest of the session, we will be recording for those of you who are just signing in now, just so that we can share this with anybody who was unable to attend today. Um, but you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're gonna do a couple more of these sessions. On the 16th, we are going to have Port Day. So we have a number of our officials from the port that are going to share a lot of the great projects coming up, a lot of the programs that are still moving forward, and then share some insight into how operations are moving currently. Um, additionally, we have, due to the uh, recent election, we have some musical seats with some folks that were scheduled. So we'll get you the full slate of folks that are coming for the next couple of sessions over the coming days. On December 1st, we do have Supervisor Cox. Um, we thought it'd be a great way to kind of wrap up some of our sessions with the supervisor as he's wrapping up his term, his amazing years of service here in South County and the County of San Diego in general. Additionally, we're working on putting together uh, a session that'll have uh, members of the boards from our local water districts. So you'll be able to hear them and be able to gain some insight into what's going on there. So I am going, I have the pleasure of introducing our chair of the board, John Moot, who will share some insight into why uh, the South County EDC thinks this is valuable. And then we'll go from there. 
So again, uh, thank you all for attending our new and approved uh, annual meeting with elected officials. Uh, obviously, it's in a different format than we've done in the past, but hopefully everyone will find this format uh, equally useful. Um, it is always great to hear from our elected officials uh, at this annual event. Um, I had the pleasure many years ago having served with Mayor Salas when she was on the City Council of Chula Vista. She's had a very distinguished career in public service, uh, of which most of us are aware. Uh, I have not had uh, the experience of working with uh, Mayor Dedina, but I have seen him on 60 Minutes, and I know him to be very famous and known for the great work he's done on the border sewage problem. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Carla Leal of Cox Communication, who, who we are very grateful for having sponsored this and let her do a formal introduction of our distinguished representatives. Thank you, John. Uh, your leadership has been invaluable. As you said, my name is Carla Leal of Cox Communications, and it's a pleasure to join you all today to introduce two of South Bay's most prominent leaders. At Cox, we focus on bringing each other closer through our products and services. In today's virtual world, it is important to stay connected to those we love and important issues. Today's event will feature an update from City of Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina and City of Chula Vista Mayor Mary Casillas Salas, followed by Q&A session, all from the comfort of your home via your internet connection. First up, Mayor Serge Dedina. He is known as the Coastal Hero, serving as the mayor of the city of Imperial Beach and executive director and co-founder of Wild Coast. Mayor Serge grew up in Imperial Beach and spent his childhood helping to preserve the Tijuana Estuary as a natural, national wildlife refuge volunteer focusing on water quality issues in the 80s. Mayor Serge received the Surf Industries Environmental Award, San Diego Zoological Society's Conservation Medal, and the California Coastal Commission's Coastal Hero Award in recognition of its sustainability and conservation achievements. Before Wild Coast, Mayor Serge was the founding director of the Nat Nature Conservancy's Baja California Sea of Cortez program, where he helped to initiate successful efforts to protect Loreto Bay National Park, Espiritu Santo Reserve, and Cabo Pulmo National Park almost 20 years ago. It's no surprise that Mayor Serge is an avid surfer, swimmer, and former State of California Ocean Lifeguard. He is the author of several books, including Saving the Great Gray Whale and Sea Wild Sea Eco Wars and Surf Stories from the Coast of the California. Mayor Serge has a PhD in geography from the University of Texas, a master's in geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California, San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Serge Tadina with snaps or a wave. Well, hey, thank you, everybody. Um, glad to be here. Um, as you can see, I'm just hovering above, above the beach, and it's a pleasure to serve with um, a good friend and colleague and someone who's been uh, a mayor mentor to me, uh, Mayor Mayor, Mayor Salas, um, and uh, you know, there was a moment in the pandemic, just like there was in water quality, and I'll go back to the water quality stuff for IV, because I want to just dwell on that, because at the end of this, I want you guys to all decide that you're going to invest heavily in Imperial Beach, but uh, you know, back with water quality, we were being inundated with, you know, with beach closures and sewage, and, and for, you know, Chula Vista is an inland city where Mary grew up in IV, um, our life, first lifeguard, Dempsey Holder, uh, his son, Sean and Mary were great friends. And uh, I think you're, you made a story about your parents uh, agreeing to get married, asked each other to get married on the, our pier. And, and Mary, no hesitation to help us at all. Like 100%, not 100%, 1,000%. I'll always be grateful to you, Mary, for that and for the city of Chula Vista. And I think that exemplifies the, the spirit of cooperation and collaboration in, in the South Bay. But the same thing with COVID. I think it was a moment in, I don't know when it was, Mary, in March or April, and we were like, and Alejandro was on the call, and, and Vivian uh, Moreno from the city of San Diego, 
we're all like, hey man, we need some help. Like we all need some help mm -hmm. and it's immediate, let's do a press conference and talk about we need more testing. We need to support our residents here in South County. They're getting hammered by COVID. And I know for all of us, there was no hesitation to just jump in and do the right thing for South County together. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate that. It was, it's re always really a pleasure mm -hmm. to work with Mary, but also Alejandro I've known for a long time and, and Vivian, I think that spirit of cooperation is really important. With the South County Economic Development Council, I missed the, the hat um, I, or me refusing to wear the hat. Um, that's kind of my shit every year. Um, but uh, I can anyway, send you one if you want. I, mean. <laughs> I can put on a, a hat if you want. But anyway, um, I, I, sometimes I get a little tired of being defined by, I really wish I didn't have to spend so much time on water quality issues. Um, because it gets really tiring and really exhausting, which is why it's important to have the support of the city of San Diego and the city of Coronado and Supervisor Cox, who's been outstanding. And, you know, Kevin Faulkner has been great and the state of California and on and on, and finally get some movement in Mexico. So I think that's good. And uh, it was a tough year for us, eight months of closed beaches, 14 billion gallons of sewage uh, through a year uh, deposited into our ocean Imperial Beach, record beach closures. In fact, the south end of our beach is closed because it rained. The solution is very simple, diverging infrastructure on the US side of the border to capture those flows, and then Mexico has to fix its sewer system. And you know, folks like Doug have been talking about water reuse, so that's, that's important. So th that's good. On the COVID front, um, you know, I'll, I'll quickly get to really where we're at. And the, where we're at is we're grateful to the county for having a testing site in, in Imperial Beach. They quickly got that going. Um, and obviously much more, many more in Chula Vista, National City, and South San Diego, which is really critical. Um, the CARES Act funding, which the county, you know, the county is distributing that we got uh, as well. I know South County Economic Development Council was involved in, in, in getting money off our businesses. And I was at the optometrist and then the dentist, places I've been avoiding going um, for a while. And I'd be up, up, optometry, Imperial Beach Optometry, legendary business, been around forever on Ninth and Palm and, uh, and thanked us for that CARES Act money, right? And I had nothing to do with it. We stayed out of it. So precisely so I wouldn't be directing at places. And then my dentist, I've actually told my dentist, I've been going to that practice since I was seven in 1971. I'm the, the third dentist. It was Dr. Uh, Brunson when I was a kid and Dr. Udelman who then moved to Australia from South Africa. And then Dr. Lowe who's there now. And um, actually that business was the hobby hut when I was a kid. I used to buy my first skateboard and records there. Actually Michael, the Jackson Five and Bill Withers and the Temptations uh, and the Beatles when I was a kid. So it was really nice to have that that experience of that business. And Dr. Lowe also thanked me for um, the, the CARES Act money they got through the city. So that kind of stuff makes a big difference. It's clear for me, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do and we've been doing in ideas, cities shouldn't be pilot bureaus for opening a business. I'm, I'm gonna repeat that. If the city is like the DMV or worse for opening a business, we, we gotta change that. And one of the big issues I think is really important is that you shouldn't have to have $5 million to open a restaurant or a business Cities should be doing everything they can on low-income communities and, and communities that are disadvantaged, like, like IB, right? That have a lot of empty lots to figure out easy ways for people to open a business that don't, they don't have to go broke doing so. And I think that means figuring out how we do things like Mike Hess Brewery, alternative style, or shipping containers, et cetera. Possibly you, know, you get these temporary sort of installations or uh, making it simple to have food trucks Whatever you, we do, we've got to make it easy for entrepreneurs to figure out how to sell products and engage with our residents. And I think that helps our hometown entrepreneurs and to help get them capital, right? Investment capital, startup capital. Uh, that's so crucial uh, in, in the long-term community. So that's something we've been really trying to do in IB is make it easier to open a business, uh, waive some of those permits, uh, and just change the way that we do business so people understand that we are open for business. I think for a long time, I really felt like people, a lot of people felt like they weren't, um, that wasn't happening in IB. And I think, um, you know, since I've taken office, I've been in office for six years, um, we've gotten about $200 million in investment, uh, a new hotel, the hotel, uh, the Pier South Hotel, the uh, Mike Hess Brewery, um, you know, Coronado Brewery, uh, the Brigantine, some of San Diego's best businesses, but we've distributed economic development throughout the city. So it's not just along the, the bayfront, um, the beachfront, but it's, it's throughout the city. So that kind of stuff is really important. Um, so what's next? We just opened the Hamptons Inn. 
our Ninth and Palm Shopping Center, which is doing tremendously well. Um, and when I look at the Palm Avenue corridor that we share with Highway 75 with Coronado all the way down to San Diego, we really need to get that, that, that corridor invested in. I'm really bullish on the idea of a an, an infrastructure money that could be tied to COVID. Uh, it needs to go to cities. I think that was a missing element uh, last time. And I think Mary made a comment about Stockton getting a lot more money than Chula Vista. Um, and we really need to pump money into our cities. And it's something I've learned from Chula Vista. It's infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. It's got 70% uh, support from voters to have a sales tax initiative, our first in our history. Let's you know support public safety. And I want to thank Mary um, without having Chula Vista having done that successfully, by the way, and shown that they're investing in their fire stations, really impressive stuff in their uh, other infrastructure in the city related to public uh, safety and other things. Uh, I'm really, really impressed with that. So that means we'll have a little bit more resources um, to deal with. That, that's really, really good news. But um, we need to populate uh, Highway 75 or in San Diego and IB with more uh, commercial buildings and more affordable housing. And I think, you know, I've made this really clear if there's any folks involved in housing policy at the state level, I'm a little tired of hearing about battles in wealthy communities that don't want housing when we have, we need a lot more housing to go to um, affordable housing and middle-class housing to go to cities like Imperial Beach. And I, I'll give you, I, I just be honest with you, we've got two projects ready to go, senior housing and another awesome uh, affordable housing project. I can't get a single dime of state investment for those projects at all, zero. We have not received a single dime of, of state funding for affordable housing. We can't compete. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with our colleagues in Chula Vista City, mm -hmm. our national city. So I think that's a, a big problem for us. So I really want to make sure that we really work with our state officials and others to get um, that funding uh, directed to Imperial Beach. And then um, number two, I think we really need to start looking at um, parks and rec and opportunities for our children as really a quality of life and public safety issue. Now, I, and right now with the, with the pandemic, our, our kids, not only are we suffering a public health crisis and are we suffering an economic crisis, but our kids, our families, and our seniors are suffering a mental health and, 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 and public health uh, crisis. They are, we talked to a, a doctor at Urgent Care today, record numbers of suicide attempts, um, and talked to parents today trying to get, figure out how to get their kids engaged. And I think right now we need some help from the county and the state. Not what we can't do, we know we can't do. We need to figure out how we get investments to cities like Imperial Beach where the kids are running, basically running a muck, right? Like we don't have a parks and rec program. You know, we have to call the sheriffs because kids are destroying our skate park. And we need to get some investment to figure out how we get through the next four to six months, right? Locking down and to deal with the pandemic, whatever we have to do is important. We've got to figure out how to keep these kids engaged because otherwise if we don't, we're going to have a lost generation. Um, I don't want to end there on a bummer. We are moving forward on the Clean Beaches Initiative. We will have clean beaches. It's gonna take a lot more work, but um, I'll, I'll end here. Invest in IB. If I had a lot of money, which I don't, I actually don't know how to make money. Uh, that's why I run a nonprofit in my real life. I would invest all I had in IB. I, in, in addition to Chula Vista National City in South San Diego, of course, but um, we're a great investment. If you wanna do hotels, restaurants, affordable housing, housing, Come to IB. We can't wait to have you and help it make it easy to make investment. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, esteemed colleague, uh, and mayor mentor, Mary Mary Salas. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and South County. Thank you. So, first of all, I have to say that um, it has been such a joy to work with Ale and Serge and then Vivian because um, we have really become a force for the South Bay. And, and Serge mentioned it. And, and the first thing that we did together. Uh, is that Serge, Ali, and, and myself, is we were the first cities in San Diego County to um, mandate wearing masks. And so, um, and we had to face a lot of challenges with the other mayors in North County cities that weren't affected by COVID like we were, because as we were trying to put protocols in place to keep our community safe, they were denying the virus and making it really tough for us to get cooperation from our citizens. But I think that now everybody understands that this uh, pandemic is real and that uh, we all have to remain disciplined if we wanna get out of this and that we all are in this together. And um, the people that were saying, no, we're not, <laughs> I think they're coming to the realization that we've just gotta stay focused and, and, and focused on this, on this pandemic. But I wanna compliment Serge 
in the time that he's been in office. You've seen the transformation of Imperial Beach. He's absolutely right. I wish I would have invested in Imperial Beach a long time ago. Now I can't afford to. <laughs> so, um, but the city's looking beautiful. And, uh, you know, the affinity that I have uh, for Imperial Beach is exactly what Serge said. I went to Catholic school in Imperial Beach. Imperial Beach was my playground. Um, my dad proposed to my mom on the beach in Imperial Beach. Um, and so we have a great love of that community. Um, Chula Vista is doing great things. If you look at and uh, if you look at Third Avenue right now, we are in the final stages of, of planning landscaping um, where we did the beautification of Third Avenue. It looks absolutely beautiful. Um, it's just such a joy to be down there. Um, uh, you know, the pandemic has um, hit us in very, very strange ways. So in some areas, um, people are suffering greatly, but in other areas, um, they are unaffected economically and they're actually thriving in this, in this uh, pandemic world. Um, we see it in our housing. I mean, if you look at housing prices, they continue to go up and there's such a demand for housing. And that is a, a problem because what's happening is middle-class families are being um, priced out of the housing market. But I see Bob Penner there um, and uh, Home Fed and the Escaya project is just beautiful. And you're selling houses just as fast as you can build them. And uh, so uh, it, it just adds to our, our beautiful community. We've got a lot of new apartments that are coming into the west side of Chula Vista, really um, bringing up our, our neighborhoods. And so there's a lot to look forward to. And then of course our Bayfront, you know, we are going to have a groundbreaking next year. It's really great that we're to this point again. And if you go down there to the Bayfront, you'll see the construction that has already begun. Uh, the new RV park is scheduled to open in January. They're taking reservations already. And so um, it's gonna spark a lot of activity down there on the Bayfront. Um, we do have some challenges coming from Sacramento. Um, last year, they passed this bill, AB 1486, um, which really hampered the city's ability to control its city-owned property um, on the courtyard and to work with MTS to build a transit-oriented uh, development um, on the MTS side on E Street um, and on uh, and on F Street where we own the courtyard. So um, what we're having to do next year is really to, next legislative session, is to really work with Lorena Gonzalez and um, our other delegation to fix that bill because it has some serious implications for communities. And I know the intent of it. So the intent of the bill is to make sure that the first um, offer of, of, of um, those projects, the city owned um, projects, agency owned projects, is that you have to make them available for affordable housing. But that doesn't make sense in a lot of areas. And if you look at the MTS site on E Street and our, our courtyard situation there, um, we were jointly planning that with MTS um, to have a cohesive and integrated community there where you would have mixed use of business hotels um, and, and housing. And so uh, that's, that's put our plans there uh, on a hold uh, until we can get um, you know, the bill fixed to where it makes more sense than it, and it does now. Um, things are going um, pretty well on the east side. Um, what's really interesting is that we got a, a report from um, da David uh, Bilby, who's our finance guy last week relative to our budget. And we're not being hit as hard as we thought we were. So like our hotel occupancy, whereas the city of San Diego, I don't know about you, Serge, but at least in the city of Chula Vista, our occupancy rates in the new hotels in the east are good. And so um, we actually are on track with the, the uh, pre-COVID revenue projections for TOT that we had in the past. And we're really grateful for that. Um, so what that showed is that there was a demand for hotel rooms in the South Bay and we built the hotels and they're still being utilized. So I think that speaks well for our plans for the Bayfront um, when it opens in 2024, where we're gonna have the 1500 room 
Hotel and Convention Center. I actually think that we're going to get our convention center squared, squared away before the city of San Diego ever gets their expansion of their, their convention center. And I'm not faulting anybody. It's just the nature of the beast. You know, when you have a smaller city that's nimble and can work better is that we can get things done. Um, I think I'm going to stop it right here because um, what I'd like to, um, what I'd like to, oh, well, you know, I'm not <laughs> because there's so much to talk about. You know, congratulations, Serge, with that, the passage of that sales tax measure, because, you know, we say here at, around City Hall, if it hadn't been for the tax measures that we passed um, back in 2016 and again in 2018, the city of Chula Vista would have been in deep doo-doo and our streets and our roads would have been just really shabby. And um, we have been able to do so much with that half cent sales tax that the voters entrusted to us in really repairing all aspects of our infrastructure. So the city is looking good because of that sales tax measure. And, uh, you know, um, we were happy to work, work with Surge and show them, uh, you know, uh, show them how we were able to do it. And so congratulations to you. It's gonna be great for your city. And IB will continue to look awesome. It really does. <laughs> really different from the beach town that I used to uh, go to, although I'm really nostalgic for those little old beat up wooden beach houses that used to be on the beach. But uh, things change, right? Um, so I think I'll stop it at that. Um, you know, our sales tax measure has done so much uh, to help us, not only with our infrastructure, but for hiring the police and firefighters that we need. So um, am I supposed to hand it off to somebody? Like Ale, is Ale going to talk today? Because I heard that, um, are you next Ale? Uh, no, we had the two of you scheduled today. Oh, uh, oh you, guys are, you guys are special today. You guys, <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to bring back Mayor Solis, I promise you. Um, but I did want to hand it back to our chair, John Mood, who is going to walk us through some Q&A and hopefully we can, maybe we can do it together since you both mm -hmm. actually have presented and we have Mayor Solis too. If there's mm -hmm. questions for all three of you, we'd love to throw that in. But before we do that, I also wanted to give Carla an, uh, uh, from Cox an opportunity if she would like to share um, some of the great things going on at Cox as well, right? Thank you. Um, well, I, I sort of mentioned, obviously, we wanted to sponsor this event in its virtual forum because we are about bringing people together. So thank you to both Mayor Serge Medina and Mayor Mary Casillas Salas for being here. I will leave comments for later. I did just want to acknowledge Mayor Salas. I know that you are such a trailblazer, not just to the city of Chula Vista, but also during your time at the state legislator. And you have helped to bring more women in office, bring best practices. And so you just didn't need an introduction. I had one prepared, <laughs> but um, you know, thank you for, for being so helpful and modest and um, always bringing this forward. So I will turn it back to you actually, Jim, because I think Q&A is more important. And if you have any questions on Cox, let me know. Happy to talk to you on sidebar. Thanks so much. I appreciate that, Carl. Um, John, all yours. Well, uh, I thought I will, while people are thinking of questions they may have, uh, you can submit them through the chat room and uh, Jim and I will keep an eye on that and we'll try to call on people. Uh, but I thought I might start it out with uh, an election question. Um, it does look like the election results are going to materially affect the Board of Supervisors and its, comp and its uh, makeup. Um, as well as uh, some of the city council races in the city of San Diego. So my question to the both of both mayors are, do you expect any changes in the way Sandag is operating and the issues that may come before Sandag and if they may be looked at or treated differently uh, than prior to uh, the election? No, I'll well, ready, uh, <laughs> start. <laughs> Do you want me to start? Well, I think whatever you want, whatever, whatever you want. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can anticipate that there will be changes of the representatives that sit on Sandag. And I think that it's going to be actually good for us uh, because um, uh, uh, Sandag was becoming entirely too polarized. And um, 
it, it was becoming this battle between people that wanted to retain the status quo and think that transportation uh, needs and demands were gonna remain the same as they were in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And so I really believe that the new SANDAG board is really gonna have uh, a different vision for uh, transportation in, in San Diego County and a vision that is going to uh, really enhance different modes of traveling besides highway and freeway traveling. And so I think it's going to bode well for the South Bay um, having more investment in uh, in transit and uh, and in um, in uh, the high uh, the uh, rapid uh, system where people are moving efficiently and getting out of their cars. And uh, speaking about getting the out of the cars is that you know when you honor Greg Cox on December the first, um, we are going to have to thank him uh, profoundly for the Bayshore Bikeway. And what a wonderful the asset that that has been for the South Bay. So yes, I believe that there's gonna be a lot of changes on Sandag and it's gonna be for the good. I'll just comment and you know, Mary and I have been on them. I think, and Alejandro, a very so positive, collegial uh, group um, that is interested in actually getting things done quickly and moving forward. And you know, the reality is when you're, you're public official, what you realize is, the most effective thing you can do is invest in infrastructure, right? Whether it's roads, transportation systems, public safety, you name it, parks and rec, open space, base your bikeway, convention centers, making things happen. That's our job, right? And it reminded me when I was, I just got elected and there was a housing, uh, housing remodel that was in a fight with our former, a former official and a city manager and they couldn't figure it out. And I'm like, are you kidding? That means there's a bunch of guys I know that can't work because you guys are in a fight. Fix it. And right now, we might as well be burning money at San Diego when people start yelling and screaming about why we shouldn't do anything in San Diego. So the, the, the issue is, do we want to move for San Diego forward and invest for the future and for now and create jobs and make a better, more efficient, cleaner San Diego, right? And I, I'm going to throw credit out to Mary and Chula Vista. The Bayfront project took a long time, but at the end of the day, it improves the economy. It's going to improve the quality of life and it improves the environment, right? It actually creates more open space. And so... I think we, we know how to do these triple wins in, in the South Bay, and I think we have to expand that to all of San Diego so that we understand that we can actually go to a greener and, and more prosperous future by doing the thing that government does best, which is investing in our future. So um, I have really enjoyed uh, serving that with Mary and Alejandra um, because I think they are so positive and constructive, and I think you're going to see a much more positive, constructive San Diego. Well, thank you. Do uh we have anybody who has a question. Uh, I can see hands raised if you do, or uh, just speak up. No one has any questions for these esteemed elected officials. Well, I would love to ask a question. And, you know, as we're looking, coming through the pandemic, um, you know, we've we've done a lot of great work helping get businesses financing to carry through together. Uh, how can we at the EDC and the communities work to ensure that while money may not be the answer to everything, we can work to eliminate, as you had mentioned, Mayor Dedina, some of the red tape in operating their business. We're launching a new website. We'd love to be able to put forward any incentives communities are putting out there. But what are the things you're hearing from the businesses in Imperial Beach that we may be able to carry through and in Chula Vista that we may be able to carry through in our planning for January moving forward and put together some solid programs to help retain jobs? Because while Part of our focus is creating jobs. It's definitely retaining the existing jobs we have here today. Yeah, no, good. I, I think the move, immediate move to parking lots and outside activity is, is critical. I think we need to help. Uh, I don't know if we can drink outside, but I definitely think we need to figure out how restaurants are going to survive the, the winter. We're not the Northeast, but um, obviously that's a concern. I think even gyms, right? How do we, how do we, if gyms have to move outside, it's been tough for gyms. And I think they filed a lawsuit against me and, uh, Mayor of Claremont, Donna Fry, I'm not actually making that up. 
Um, so they got a little confused, but um, anything we can do to figure out how to help businesses thrive outside or in this mixed environment, I think it's critical. And I think cities across the, the, the region, across the, the country, actually, and globally, have been very interested in doing that. And I, I, I hope, you know, I'm a, like Coronado Breweries in the parking lot, but we, they don't really need, and because uh, it has five spaces, and they've been great. I hope that stays that way, right? Like, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of changes we're realizing we can do. So I'll, I'll just end it there, but I think um, cities have been very adaptable, and I think it's just a good thing, a good foreboding for the future that we can figure things out and we want to move quickly. Yeah, so I, I agree with Serge that, you know, um, that here in Chula Vista is that we have been very, very flexible with businesses and, um, you know, uh, allowing them to expand beyond their their uh, storefront area for, um, you know, restaurants and, 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 uh, uh, and drinking establishments. You don't call them drinking establishments like breweries, right? Yeah, so we've been really flexible about that. I know our economic development department has been marvelous about reaching out to businesses when the COVID first started. Um, actually, people from the, from the South County EDC were involved in this as well. Um, went out and personally, not we, we knocked on so many business doors, um, you know, letting them know what was available to them um, giving them all the new protocols, making sure that they knew that they had, you know, help within the city if they were experiencing problems with permitting or whatever else was, was a barrier for them to operate. And we need to continue to do that kind of thing. The beauty is that we continue to see new businesses opening. So there are a lot of them that are not surviving. They're going to close, you know, they're, they're, they're going to fail, and we feel really bad about that. Um, but there are other businesses that are seizing the opportunity of the moment and actually have a great deal of faith in the recovering economy that are investing in and opening businesses. So, um, you know, who knows what the future will bring? I think we're going to be operating in a, in a whole new, different business environment where, um, where you know, uh, politicians and government entities are going to, you know, see the need um, to really be more flexible about businesses coming into the community and helping them stay open. You, you know, one thing I was going to say, though, is I think the state of California just needs to figure that out on housing. Like, you know, there's a housing crisis, but the state's still pre-COVID era, like thinking where it takes years to actually invest in and bootstrap housing. And <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the holdup is, but they got to funnel money to cities much, much quicker, like immediately. Like there should, and you know, doing, I agree with the, you know, the people who want to get rid of CEQA or just figure out CEQA on housing because, you know, I shouldn't have to do CEQA uh, analysis for, you know, a 25 unit affordable housing thing on, on project on Palm Avenue and the state should be funneling money there. So I think the lessons we're learning on COVID with businesses are exactly the lessons we need to fix this housing crisis, which is, Stop the bureaucracy, figure it out, get stuff done quickly, and let's not let this crisis fester. And that's what I mean. I think it's been really great about this crisis. The only thing is that we figured out how to do things really quickly and uh, and move to support people who need it. So it's a good template. Well, I have a I have a follow up question on housing. I think in this election we again saw. A, a ballot initiative to overturn a decision of a city council a governmental entity on a housing project. In the election before that, uh, we saw other big projects uh, essentially killed again by taking the decisions of the city council to uh, the voters who then overturned the approval of the projects. I'd be interested for both mayors, the, what can we do as a as a business community and with our various organizations like ours and the chamber to try to change this dynamic in which it seems that if the voters get a chance uh, they won't approve the housing projects whereas uh, members of the city councils uh, seem to to recognize the need for it is there anything that be, can be done to sort of change that dynamic well john i i, I that the South County EDC has weighed in before in helping the city uh, muster support for some of those projects that faced opposition. 
And I think that's an important thing for um, any business organization to continue to do. Um, because a lot of times people are not um, voting because of the facts, but because of emotions, because of the fear of something that they think will happen in the future. And what I've seen many times over the many years that I've been um, involved in city government is that the people that oppose those projects and they think it's gonna be the end of life as they knew it, when those projects actually come on board and they see that it's actually enhanced in their communities, then they're okay. But it's getting, it's getting past that hurdle. And it's also um, talking to those uh, elected officials that maybe are a little bit green. Uh, maybe they listen too much to maybe uh, that small core of anti, uh, you know, development people that are, are within their district. Um, I think that you have to uh, like give them the courage to stand up to the NIMBYs. Um, and that means that you that the business community and the uh, YIMBYs have to organize just as strongly as the NIMBYs. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I think what happens a lot of time in California, and this is happening on sea level rise, where there was an obsession with managed retreat um, with the California Coast Commission instead of focusing on adaptation and infrastructure. And so we got bogged down in these battles over like millionaires homes in Del Mar and then ignored the rest of the coastline mm -hmm. kept shifting. Same thing in California. I think it's interesting, you know, you look at National City and I'm jealous of National City and Chula Vista because of all the housing they're building and we just can't get any money, uh, affordable housing money. But, um, you know, we spent 10 times as much effort on building in the housing in the places that want it instead of focused on the three areas in the state that don't, we'd actually have a lot more housing done. So I think the problem is there's not enough money flowing quickly enough into the field to get housing built all over the state. And we're stymied by some of these, you know, uh, NIMBY, pro you know NIMBY processes that kill housing and it becomes a crisis, right? But there's a lot more money flowing into the places that need housing and get it done quickly. And I'll give you an example. The, San the corridor from Palm Avenue, from the uh, Saturn or Trolley Station in, in, in Palm Avenue down to IB should be a, a massive investment location for affordable housing. It's, there's no opposition to it. Everybody wants it. They need it, right? Like, we don't have to change density requirements. We've got already done. The zoning's ready. There's tons of empty lots. There's tons of blight. Please, let's make that a priority, right? And so um, that's what I see. The state has to do better at getting things done quickly. And instead of talking a good game on how progressive we are and how fast we move, and then when you look at this ossified bureaucracy we have, it just moves way too slowly, at least for, in, in my case, because I'm really, really impatient. So anyway. All right, we have a question in the comments from Bill as well, right along these lines. Um, how, what type of monetary assistance or approval can we, mo can we help uh, bring forward to develop, for the development of low cost and senior housing projects in both of the communities, but in the South County as a whole? What kind of money? Well, what kind of resources do we need to help make sure that we have senior housing and low cost, low cost housing? Obviously, every project has a portion that's dedicated to low income. <laughs> but beyond that, the senior housing element here, how can we work together as a, I'm just paraphrasing the question now, so. Well, you know, to me, the whole process of tax credits for, for low income housing, I mean, I just don't get it. Um, I don't get why, why affordable housing um, is so expensive. I don't even know what the cost per door is anymore, um, but it's so ridiculous. And, um, you know, building the affordable housing in the way that we have in the past, you know, with the inclusionary ha housing policies, I mean, in a way it's good because, you know, the development community is incentivized to build that affordable housing kind of component but in another way is that just adding 10% um, low mod housing to an uh, entire development is not cutting it and bringing on the kind of product that we need to really truly make housing affordable. And I know the development community is not going to like this, but you know what? We've got too many McMansions, too many um, huge houses that have these 
uh, ridiculously big rooms. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, the average, you know, they, they used to say that the average home was like about between 1400 and 1500 square feet. Now, you know, people are demanding, you know, 23, you know, 2300 square foot homes, you know, with a separate this and a separate that. There's a lot of wasted space with a, in those houses. And so the product, I understand the builders build it because they get more money for it, but it's really, you know, leaving us with a dearth of affordable housing. And, you know, how do you change that profit mo motive, right? In order to build, um, you know, a, a more affordable stock of housing. Because, you know, the middle class is being left out. They can't afford it. And now we're looking at houses here on the west side of Chula Vista that are, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, um, that are small, that are selling for six and seven hundred thousand dollars. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, I was gonna say the same thing, and you know, we we've, we've just gotta there's gotta be a top top down bottom up approach, but you know, we've got to figure out how to incentivize smaller projects. I think that the big thing as well is the labor market's so tight that if someone has an opportunity to do something that's larger scale in Chula Vista, San Diego, or National City, and then an eight unit project in Imperial Beach, they're just not gonna do the eight unit project. They can't, they can't make it work, right? So we're gonna have to figure that out. But um, that's why, you know, we all have to be bullish on infrastructure spending. We need to put people to work. We need to create, you know, we need to get that labor market engaged and get people good, good paying jobs and whether or not they're paving roads or building bridges or building houses, right? Like that's gonna have to be something that governments take, you know, with larger purse strings, take a lot more seriously. And we've seen how much, you know, this CARES Act funding, how good that did the economy to keep people, you know, working. And I think we're gonna have to do a lot more of that. We've realized that uh, it's critical for the United States government as well as state governments to invest back in its people, creating jobs and investing in the future. And that's, we all have to agree that that's, that's, that's the way we have to go forward. And we're not gonna have more people gonna move to Arizona and other states <laughs> Maybe that was good, right? That Nevada's changed demographically and uh, they Nevada and Arizona has become blue states as well as Georgia. You know, I don't know. I think they're all transplants from California. So anyway. Uh, we have a little bit more time. Um, I, I wanted to switch gears and, and ask both the mayors about the homeless situation. And has that been getting worse during COVID? And uh, do we believe there are any answers to that problem? Uh, coming out of this uh, financial crisis uh, involving uh, the pandemic and uh, what thoughts and plans are, are, are in place to maybe deal with uh, a, a exponential growth in homelessness due to uh, uh, the current uh, sort of economic crisis, especially with so many businesses uh, ceasing to operate. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're going to see an explosion in the homeless population. Um, I live in downtown Chula Vista, and I'm seeing more and more people out on the streets. And as these eviction moratoriums end, and uh, those balloon payments are, you know, going to be demanded from from families, they're going to be kicked out. So um, it's a big social problem, and. Um, people don't like to look at the homeless. They don't like to see them. They don't like to see them for the human beings that they are, that, but for the grace of God, it could be them. But um, here in the city of Chula Vista, we've been working to um, try to get a uh, bridge shelter constructed. We've reached a hurdle. We had a, 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 a parcel identified and then the uh, Coastal Conservancy said, no, you can't, you can't do that because that was supposed to be for the Coastal Conservancy. So we're trying to figure out a land swap with the Cor uh, Coastal Conservancy because that site I think will be ideal because it's on the border of South San Diego. And um, so I think it'll be a resource for not only the, the homeless in Chula Vista, but um, the city of South San Diego and Imperial Beach that we can have a, a place where people can go and get wraparound services. And I think that we have a very good chance of getting it built. You know, before we ran into this problem with the Coastal Conver Convergence Conver Conservancy, um, we were shooting for an opening date, um, you know, by the end of this year. Um, it's not gonna happen by the end of this year, but I really think that we have to really invest in those resources because the way it works now, 
people don't want to see homeless on the streets. Well, constitutionally, if we do not have an alternative for them to move to, you know, to get shelter, then too bad. Cities have to allow them to be wherever they are. And so, um, so I think it will continue to be a big problem. I think you're going to see more. Um, I think cities have been banging their heads against the wall, trying to figure out what to do about this problem. Um, and there's not every homeless person is the same. You know, there are people that are, are down in their luck that have a chance to get out of this if they have the proper resources to get them on the right path again. There are another, I think, greater majority that are just so whacked out and addicted to drugs and alcohol that you wonder if they can ever recover. I mean, they've gone, they've spiraled down so much. Um, so it's a real tough social problem. And I don't think there's any easy answers. We can try like our bridge shelter, uh, you know, investing in that. Um, and that'll help a lot of people, but it won't help everybody. Can you unmute, uh, unmute Mayor? Sorry, I don't think I can add anything to that. I think Mary sort of framed it perfectly. I don't know if Ali, Mary, so, so tell us at least has anything to say on that. Um, I know you've been working on that issue as well. Well, this is your guys' party, but I've been invited. So <laughs> I think I think as we talk about the regional issues of uh, the unsheltered, and um, it's really important that we talk about what both of you covered early on. It's the demand for housing and that it's that housing first mentality and if we can't provide homes for the people that need it right now we're just uh, kicking the can down the road um, and I think it's it's really important because it's it's a continuum of services and it's, it's the housing first and then we can talk about how to assess their needs whether there are any um, you know addictions or other uh, things that they may need help with and so I, I, um, I, I uh, definitely support my colleagues here. And I know that as we talk about it regionally, uh, we know that it just doesn't stay within our zip codes. And it may look a little different in each of our neighborhoods, but we still have the same concerns. We still want people to thrive. We still want them because they are somebody's daughter. They are somebody's son. And if we have that humanity first as well, just that's a person uh, that may need that help. Uh, I think it's also a way of turning the page. Yes, it's going to be in it for the long haul, but uh, as, as any of the parents here know, you know, uh, teaching a child or teaching, uh, teaching somebody a new trick or even the dog, kid, whatever, it takes time. And we learn these new, new things and we have to do it for our communities and for our kids. So I definitely echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Thank you for, for inviting me to your party to answer questions. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention one, one other thing uh, that I hope people take to heart because, you know, I look at my situation, I look at the situation of my family and, and I think, you know what, we're pretty much insulated. We're A-OK. -okay. You know, we have a job that, you know, we are guaranteed a paycheck um, because our jobs continue. But there are so many people are in our community that, that are now, if, if they haven't lost their job, they've lost hours and they're really working with, um, with uh, diminished resources. And I gotta tell, tell you, if you want a, a dose of humanity and get a dose of, of gratitude, work on one of those food giveaways um, that are being sponsored by so many of our nonprofits. You know, spend a day handing out food to people that, that um, you can see the panic in their eye. You can see that the gratefulness for them receiving some kind of food so that they can feed their families. I mean, when it comes to that, you know, hunger in, a, in, in our community, food insecurity, and in this land of plenty where so much food goes to waste, it's really heartbreaking. So I would encourage all of you to volunteer at one of these food distribution sites and just to see you know, just to get a reality check that we may be living a comfortable life, but there are thousands and thousands of our neighbors that are really sweating this out and wondering where they're going to get their next meal, how they're going to pay their rent, 
and how they're going to feed their families. So um, that's, I, I hated to end on that downer, but you know, those are the kind of things that worry me all the time, you know? I, I won't end on downer because I think what's been inspiring for me is to be with my colleagues, Alejandro and, and Mary, and <laughs> we are really fighting. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to make sure that it's not just our residents that get a fair shake, but South County does, right? Like, you know, the reality is the North-South divide is real. And if I hear another person in the wealthiest communities in the world tell me how they're suffering, I might, might literally will tear my hair out. Like it's actually gets a little embarrassing. Um, you know, when I hear people in, you know, living in some of the world's wealthiest communities talk about how, how they're suffering, I'm thinking, really, are you serious? Like, have you, been down, have you been down to the South Bay lately? So I think that commitment to equity social equity and how we spend money. That's something that's been a real discussion in San Diego and it's affected San Diego. That's a discussion we're gonna have at the county, right? To make sure that mm -hmm. South County gets its fair share and that we make sure that we put our kids and our families and our communities and our neighborhoods first and foremost. And it's something grew up with broke immigrant parents. They weren't poor, we just didn't have any money. And you know, my dad lost his job. We had to pick tomatoes at the tomato fields in, um, in Chula Vista. We had free day for the people who didn't have jobs. And my parent, my mom had to go to the commodity food store. So, you know, I've been there and I know what it's like to not, to be scrambling and, you know, my parents struggling to pay the rent. That, that, that feeling will never leave me. And that's why we put kids and families in our neighborhoods and first in IB. And I think that's why I'm so glad to work with uh, Mary and, and, and all hundred national cities. I know that's our commitment as well. Doug, did you have a question? Nope. Well, maybe one last question. Um, there's been talk on the national level of defunding police. Uh, is COVID, oh, hell no. <laughs> is, is, is COVID going to end up defunding police? Uh, or, or are our police budgets going to uh, survive all this? Or what's, what's it looking like in, in both your cities for uh, uh, maintaining uh, funding for police? I, I don't think anybody's really in support of defunding them, no. as far as I know, but uh, it may be happening whether we want to or not. What's the prospects look like? Well, I'll tell you what, the city of Chula Vista, um, we, you know, we, we really spend a lot of our general fund on public safety, right? But in spite of that, uh, we still have one of the smallest police departments and fire departments in the whole state. And so... Um, what you have to look at is, no, you, you, you don't look at defunding police. You need your police. Absolutely, you need police. What you need to do is work smarter with the money that you have. And so that means adopting new technologies and protocols like the drone system, you know, the drone program that we have in Chula Vista. That's been amazing in helping us meet, um, you know, uh, response times. And in cases, uh, de-escalating situations, the more information you have, the officer has before he goes to a situation, he or she goes to a situation, you know, that the better the outcomes. And so um, it's a use of technology that we're going to have to turn to to be build more efficiencies. Uh, but certainly um, uh, our police officers are asked to do so much. So when people talk about defunding the police, um, you have to ask them, what do you really mean by that? So some people say, well, you know, send social workers instead of police officers. Well, it has to be a pretty, you know, specific incident that you're going to do that. I don't think any social worker wants to walk into, you know, a domestic violence situation where there's guns going, right? So, um, so no, uh, this whole discussion of, of defund the police, um, it's, it's a non-starter here in the city of Chula Vista. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, having grown up in the old school biker IV, and I know Mary remembers that, when it wasn't a really safe place to be at the foot of the pier. Um, it was a dirt lot, and the Hells Angels hang out, hang out there, and the Satan's Jokers. Um, it was like something out of a biker movie. Um, and when we had rampant crime, um, so now we have one of the safest cities in San Diego County, beach cities. Actually, we have a lower crime rate, I think, in Coronado, which I'm, I'm really proud of. But, you know, that, that has been something that has accompanied filling up empty lots uh, with businesses, tearing down chain link fences. And you know, we talk about crime, well, it's a crime to have a slum. Like we've been really making sure that we crack down on slum lords, we crack down on blight, that we populate our neighborhoods with, uh, we fill in the empty lots with pocket parks, 
Um, and as we've done that, and we've partnered to clean up and brighten up our city and put it, paint murals and keep the trash off the streets and make sure that we create a welcoming environment so people can walk on, the, on, on our street, our crime rate has absolutely plummeted. It's actually been really interesting. And, and getting, and, you know, even before I was mayor, I worked with the sheriffs to focus on intelligence driven uh, crime prevention so that they're really focused on the bad guys. You know, re reality, I don't want a lot of meth dealers in my city. That was a problem. They really focused on getting those guys out. Um, and so we're not cracking down on, on black kids and, Mex and, and uh, Latino kids with um, skateboards, right? And I think that's where we have to really go is be smarter, be more efficient. Um, but yeah, that, those terms are, are a non-starter because I think everybody in our city, 70% just voted for a sales tax initiative that was about protecting public safety. Well, uh, I want to thank both, uh, both our mayors. Uh, it was great to hear from you. And before uh, we sign off for the day, Carla, any closing comments uh, for Cox? Again, thank you very much for sponsoring this event. Uh, you were great to us uh, for our uh, economic summit and great for sponsoring this. And if you have any closing thoughts or comments, we'll turn it over to you yes. before we end. To snap to our guest speakers. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much. Um, Jim, do we know the date for the next one yet? As of the next session will be uh, the 16th and it'll be our port day. So we look forward to having you there. We already have about 50 registrants. So anybody who has not registered, please do. And we'll get you out the information. Okay. Well, thank you uh, to everybody uh, for attending. Thanks to Jim and Efren for uh, getting this put together. And I'll have a safe uh, walk or drive home or walk around the house, whichever it is. <laughs>